We are surrounded by a society that's directly opposed to Christian morality. Duty is proclaimed an empty word. Conscience is mere prejudice. Divorce, a right. Adultery, a weakness readily excused. Purity and fidelity are ridiculed. Vice is exalted and virtue scorned. It's very difficult to resist evil in the spiritual battle we daily face, not only because of the alluring temptations that barrage our senses, but also because the struggle against our disordered passions can cause us to become exhausted and discouraged. Sadly, many of us allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the worldly concerns that weigh heavily upon us. It's the same old story. We're attentive to our physical needs, such as food, clothing, exercise, etc. Yet, how many of us think little of providing nutrition and strength for our soul in order to keep it in good health? The spiritual life of our mortal soul cannot be neglected. It too needs attention, care, and tending. The confraternity of Mary Immaculate Queen was established to provide a solid spiritual framework in the lives of the laity, resulting in deep supernatural peace. By faithfully observing the rule of the confraternity, souls are inspired and fortified as they strive to serve God according to their state in life. By definition, the confraternity is an association of men and women, married and single, who, sharing in the religious and apostolic life of the congregation of priests, brothers and sisters of Mary Immaculate Queen, through the observance of their rule and the practice of total consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary, strive under the direction of the congregation to attain Christian perfection. How is this accomplished? First, our monthly confraternity meetings provide solid spiritual guidance. In his sermon, the local confraternity director explains important aspects of the interior life, helping the members avoid spiritual pride and other dangers. The greatest dangers facing laypersons are pride, self-will, and obstinacy. St. Bernard said that he who has himself for a spiritual director has a fool for his guide. He who would be his own teacher becomes a pupil of a fool. Spiritual persons, even far advanced in years, have been misled by excessive trust in their own judgment, attachment in their own will, and disobedience to their spiritual director. Almighty God could lead us without the aid of another, but to keep us humble, he desires us to submit to the guidance of a confessor or spiritual director. St. Gregory said, it is true that some saints have been guided directly by God, but such examples are much more to be admired than imitated. For thinking ourselves above the guidance of men, we might easily be led into error. God blesses obedience, but he who withdraws himself from obedience withdraws himself from grace. St. Vincent Ferrer stated that souls who desire to make spiritual progress seek spiritual direction. He who has an advisor whom he obeys will succeed much more easily and quickly than he could if left to himself, even if endowed with quick intellect and possessed of learned spiritual books. Secondly, the rule provides a practical framework of fr prayer for a busy layperson's schedule. The soul finds a practical means to combine prayer with action in the well-regulated spiritual life provided by the rule of the confraternity. One who follows a well-defined rule of life saves considerable time because he knows what to do and when to do it. Even if the schedule is not minutely detailed, at least it sets off time periods and lays down principles regarding prayer, work, family responsibilities, recreation, etc. By the time we acquired Mount St. Michael in 1977, the Jesuits who had built and occupied that once thriving religious house, had only two common spiritual exercises, five minutes of morning prayers and benediction of the so-called Blessed Sacrament on Sundays. It's no wonder they lost their faith. In sharp contrast, the confraternity provides an excellent daily prayer schedule based on that of the religious of Mary Immaculate Queen. It includes the recitation of the Little Office of the Immaculate Conception in the Rosary, meditation and mental prayer in the morning, examination of conscience at midday and in the evening, and spiritual reading. 
With the exception of the recitation of the office, these spiritual exercises are not extraordinary since they are short and commonly performed by the average devout lay person. Obviously, due to the many duties and responsibilities of the laity, the time devoted to prayer is shorter than that of the priest and sisters. Before being admitted to the confraternity, candidates should study the rule in order to learn their obligations. Although its observance does not bind under pain of sin, and allowances are made for special conditions. If necessary, the superior general, our bishop, can dispense confraternity members from any precept of the rule. In addition, the director of the chapter can, for reasonable cause, dispense his subjects in individual cases. Due to unusual, unforeseen circumstances, such as a necessary act of charity or the fulfillment of an urgent duty, some of our spiritual exercises may occasionally be shortened or omitted. However, when the situation returns to normal, the soul should habitually perform the prescribed spiritual exercises. The role of the confraternity is firm enough to provide an excellent spiritual framework. At the same time, it also provides some latitude when necessary. For example, in permitting one to recite seven Our Fathers, Hail Marys, and Glory Bees, one unable to pray the little office. Some of you might ask, wherein lies the value of membership? Why should I join the confraternity? First, the practice of true devotion to Mary, the spirituality of the confraternity, is an easy, short, and secure road to Christian perfection. Secondly, those who faithfully observe the role of the confraternity and recite the required prayers will make true spiritual progress. Third, the spiritual conferences and direction provided will safely and securely guide the soul along the road to holiness. Fourthly, the special prayers and masses are offered for the deceased members of the confraternity. A requiem mass is offered each month in our religious houses where five or more religious reside for the departed members of our congregation, which also includes departed confraternity members. In addition, the rule requires confraternity members to daily recite one, Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be for the living and deceased of the entire congregation. The masses and prayers offered for the deceased members of the confraternity are very beneficial because with time the departed are often forgotten by the living. I'm sure you're familiar with the adage, out of sight, out of mind. Sadly, you cannot rely on the prayers of others because too often, after the normal grieving process is over, you will soon be forgotten. However, after your death, you can rely on the suffrages offered by the religious of the congregation and its confraternity members. If your soul is detained in purgatory, their masses and prayers will help deliver you from your sufferings and hasten your entrance into heaven. I'll briefly describe the spiritual duties of confraternity members. They daily recite the little office of the Immaculate Conception. What is meant by the term, the office? An office is a specific group of prayers approved by the Church. The divine office, daily recited by priests and many religious, is the official prayer of the Catholic Church, composed of various prayers and spiritual readings. It consists primarily of the 150 psalms, or sacred songs written by King David that are recited throughout the week. The Psalms express sentiments of adoration, praise, joy, contrition, sorrow, and remorse. They also express our dispositions towards God, love, humility, faith, dependence, trust, repentance, petition, and so forth. When one recites the divine office, he or she is praying in union with Christ since he prayed the Psalms with his apostles. Besides the divine office, other offices or prayers have been approved by the Church, including the little office of the Immaculate Conception, which is recited by confraternity members. These prayers are based on the format of the divine office and are adapted for the use of religious and laity, but are not as lengthy. The little office in the Immaculate Conception is noteworthy in that it contains many Old Testament types or figures they refer to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Ideally, the office is not recited at one time, but is spaced throughout the day, unless this is not prudently possible. 
The divine office is divided into seven sections called hours. The church made these divisions in order to imitate King David, who sang the praises of God seven times a day. In total, the little office takes only about ten minutes to recite. The little office in the Immaculate Conception was composed in the 16th century, but its authorship is unknown, although some have attributed it to the Jesuit brother, St. Alphonsus Rodriguez. He recited this prayer for the last 40 years of his life, and at the command of the Blessed Virgin Mary herself, made numerous handwritten copies of it for distribution. At the college at Palma in Mallorca, St. Alphonsus gave to many Jesuit students and seminarians, including St. Peter Claver, Apostle to the Indians, copies of of this office. On March 31, 1876, Pope Pius IX granted an indulgence of 300 days for each recitation of the Little Office of the Immaculate Conception. Confraternity members also daily recite the Rosary. Our Lady of Fatima told us to recite at least five decades of the Rosary each day. Therefore, it's not surprising that it's also an obligation for confraternity members. The family Rosary is strongly encouraged because of the countless graces it brings to the home. The family that prays together stays together. Next, members are asked to spend ten minutes each morning in meditation and mental prayer. That is, an interior conversation with God. The saints teach that meditation and mental prayer, intimate personal conversation with God, are not superfluous devotions, but a basic necessity of the spiritual life. According to St. Alphonsus Maria de Liguori, it's morally impossible for him who neglects meditation to live without sin. This is confirmed by St. Teresa of Avila. He who neglects mental prayer needs not a devil to carry him to hell but he brings himself there with his own hands. St. John of the Cross has written, Without the aid of mental prayer, the soul cannot triumph over the forces of the demon. St. Alphonsus made the following striking statement. We see that many persons who recite a great number of vocal prayers, the office and the rosary, fall into sin and continue to live in sin. But she who attends to mental prayer scarcely ever falls into serious sin. And should she have the misfortune of falling into it, she will hardly continue to live in so miserable a state. She will either give up mental prayer or renounce sin. Meditation and mortal sin cannot stand together. However abandoned a soul may be, if she perseveres in meditation, God will bring her to salvation. In these days of whirlwind activity and deafening noise, it becomes more and more necessary to pause daily for interior conversation with Christ. Without this daily period of meditation, the entire spiritual life stands in danger. Is this perhaps the reason that our Blessed Mother in her program of reparation inaugurated at Fatima has requested 15 minutes meditation every first Saturday? Meditation is not an end in itself. Its purpose is to lead us to mental prayer. Just as we light a campfire with tinder and small sticks first to start the fire and then later add larger logs. So also does meditation warm the soul and prepare it to speak to God in mental prayer. Simply put, when we meditate devoutly, we fill our mind and memory with thoughts of God so we may more easily speak to Him. As demonstrated in the lives of the saints, an amazing positive change takes place in souls who form the daily habit of meditation and mental prayer. Pope Pius XII strongly encourage the practice of meditation. It must be stated without reservation that no other means has the unique efficacy of meditation and that as a consequence, its daily practice can in no wise be substituted. It's for this reason the Catholic Church obliges priests to spend some time each day in meditation. Even though we are exhorted by our Lady, by our our Lord, to pray always. The rule obliges confraternity members to spend ten minutes each morning in meditation and mental prayer. Mental prayer is simply a friendly conversation with God. Contrary to common opinion, mental prayer is not a complex process reserved only for a few gifted souls. 
St. Teresa of Avila teaches that mental prayer is a very simple manner. It's only made difficult by our self-love and cowardice. If we bridle these, mental prayer will be as natural to us as breathing or talking to a friend. St. Teresa of Avila writes, Mental prayer consists in keeping our mind on what we're saying, meaning it, and thinking of whom it is we are addressing, and who we are who dare to converse with so great a Lord. These and similar reflections constitute mental prayer. When we make mental prayer, we're reserving some time to converse alone with God, whom we know loves us dearly. If our time spent in mental prayer is fruitful, we will make rapid spiritual progress. We will not remain spiritual snails, but will run like a thoroughbred on a race course. Actually, all good and fruitful prayer is mental. When we do not make an effort to raise our minds and hearts to God, we're not praying at all, no matter what words we recite. Through the prophet Isaiah, God condemned those who honor him with their lips, but whose heart is far from him. Some mistakenly believe that our progress in mental prayer and meditation consists in feelings of sensible spiritual consolation. Although God does occasionally bestow such gifts, the heart or real essence of, of mental prayer consist in virtuous acts of the will. This is confirmed by St. Teresa who said, the fruit of prayer is good works. Meditation naturally consumes time. But this is not time lost. Rather, the time expended in meditation aids in the ultimate conversation of time. This is true, first of all, because it places the soul under the direct influence of Christ, who will then take complete charge of a person's activities. And further, the added perspective gained in meditation will enable one to better regulate his life by the separation of the non-essential from the essential. This is clearly illustrated by the saintly Benedictine Dom Chatard, who writes, One of the great bishops, overwhelmed with his duties, explained this to a statesman who also had too much to do. The latter had asked the bishop the secret of his constant work. My dear friend, said the bishop, add to your other occupations half an hour's meditation every morning. Not only will you get through your business, but you'll find time for still more. Members must also examine their conscience and recite the act of contrition before retiring. Spiritual writers teach that an examination of conscience at midday and in the evening is the most difficult spiritual exercise of all, since we're naturally proud and do not want to take responsibility for our sinful and selfish actions. Pride causes us to either excuse or minimize our sins. As a result, it's much easier to recite many prayers, perform acts of self-denial, and even to fast than to accept the blame for our sins and imperfections. However, unless we honestly examine our conscience, we will never conquer our sinful habits nor remove obstacles to grace. According to Father John Scaramelli, true purpose of amendment includes searching for the origin of our faults. We must go down into the depth of our soul to find out the root of these evil weeds so as to be able to pull them up out of our hearts. What use is there in shaking off the leaves or clipping the branches of a tree that never bears fruit? Unless the root is destroyed, all avails nothing. The tree will soon be covered with more foliage than ever. Thus our resolutions will be to little purpose so long as we do not cut off the occasions and origins of our faults. And our defects will continually return to defile our souls, however much we may resolve not to be guilty of them in the future. This is why the faithful practice of our particular examine at noon is so important. Lastly, our examination of conscience should end not only with the act of contrition, but also with the fervent prayer to God for grace never to offend Him again and to carry out in practice all that we have promised to do, remembering that we can do nothing without the help of God. A proud French magistrate once told his pastor, Father, I never go to confession for the simple reason that I never sin. That may be, said the priest, and if so, I am heartily sorry for you, for I know of only two kinds of people who do not sin. 
those who have not as yet come to the use of reason and those who have lost it. If you examine your conscience and cannot find any sins or imperfections, you have to dig deeper. A true friend will gladly point out your faults if you can't see them. Fifteen minutes a day of spiritual reading is also required. Such reading is a time-honored practice that helps us to make rapid spiritual progress. According to Father Goresh, God's grace flows mightily in upon us through the channel of good books. When we read the life of a saint, we associate with him and profit by his good example. From the writings of holy men and women, we drink in the very best of their great meditations. They are fervent prayers and holy thoughts. There is no company so charming as the company of the saints. It's vital that we read spiritual books that we like, for if we're interested in them, the grace of God will find easier entrance into our hearts. Interest rouses the mind, wards off distractions, help the me- helps the memory, and warms the will. Spiritual reading has flourished in all ages among those who truly wish to grow in sanctity. But there was never a time when it is so urgently needed as today. We are besieged by secularism in an anti-Christian worldview nearly everywhere we turn. The internet, media, movies, magazines, music, commercials, etc. allure us by their materialistic and worldly values. Spiritual reading is an excellent way to drive out the fog of worldliness and help us focus on eternal values. When we see life through the viewpoint of the saints, we're strengthened, refreshed, consoled, and encouraged. As far as membership is concerned, any person who is at least 18 years of age and is not a religious may be received into the confraternity. Such a person must be living a devout Catholic life and sincerely desire to strive for Christian perfection. The duties of membership in the confraternity of Mary Magdalene Queen are not as overwhelming as they might first appear. One needs only to review the, their usual daily routine and then reschedule according to these new priorities. It's truly amazing how God takes care of things when we put him first, miraculously providing time to perform important tasks that we apparently don't have enough time to complete. When we take time out of our busy schedules for God and give back to Him some of the precious minutes or hours of our day, He richly blesses our endeavors. By simply redirecting the minutes and even hours wasted on the computer and in watching television, you, you'll find the extra time needed to fulfill your spiritual obligations. The total time involved in the duties of confraternity membership is only 35 minutes per day. What a small sacrifice to make for so great a recompense. The companionship, encouragement, and good example of others is also a strong incentive for joining the confraternity. One who sincerely desires to advance in holiness and grace will instinctively be drawn to join with others who are striving for the same goals. We are social beings by nature. Therefore, even though one's personal Striving for holiness is an individual matter. It's very consoling to realize you're not alone in your struggle, that you are part of a spiritual family whose prayers and support you can count on here and hereafter. If you are sincere about progressing rapidly in your spiritual life and increasing your devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, you should become a confraternity member. Please contact me in this regard if you'd like to join or if you'd like more detailed information on any of the practices that are included in its membership. Let me conclude with a personal observation. My mother, Emily Radecki, was a devout Catholic prior to joining the confraternity in the late 1970s. Her good example developed my love for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, my devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and my attraction for spiritual reading. It was her deep interior life and understanding of the importance of the Mass that fostered my vocation of the priesthood. Emily's membership in the confraternity of Mary Macleod Queen has enabled her to make even greater spiritual progress. My mother's fidelity to her daily confraternity prayers rivals that of the most fervent nun. She's a living example of how the confraternity benefits one's spiritual life and also affects the lives of those with whom she comes in contact. 